Welcome to the Neophyte in the Woods podcast with Andrew McDowell. Welcome to another episode of the Neophyte in the Woods podcast. I'm your host, Andrew McDowell. We are, as always, still proud members of the Change Your POV podcast network. This is going to be a solo show. Uh, I'm going to talk about something I'm excited about, and I think a lot of folks out there are getting excited about, and and it kind of goes along with this theme of it being spring. That means a couple of things to most people. Baseball, hockey playoffs, allergies, warm weather just not up here in Massachusetts where we've had rain and snow and cold pretty consistently since the end of deer season, except for February. For some reason, February was warm. March was freezing. I I don't understand either. I'm I'm just not going to go there. But to those of us who hunt, it actually means something else. Uh, It means that it's all of those things. Plus waking up at three o'clock in the morning to creep through the woods and chase and hopefully shoot a turkey. That's right. It's turkey season. What we're going to go through today is an overview of some of the lessons that I've learned. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to call them best practices because it's really corporate sounding. And while they come from some expert sources, including Will Brantley of Field and & Stream and, and Steve Rinella of, of Meat Eater, I haven't been able to personally put them to successful use. I've struck out on the turkey hunts that I've done so far. That said... Folks who I know who are who are good turkey hunters or great turkey hunters have repeated the same type of advice to me again and again and again when I'm seeking help on on turkey hunting. So we'll go with it for for this podcast. The place you probably want to start when it comes to turkey hunting is scouting, just like deer hunting or coyote hunting or anything like that. Knowing where they are and where they're going to be is is pretty important. However, before you can even start to scout them, you really need to know where they live. And frankly, they can live anywhere. But they do have some preferred habitats. In my experience, the turkey's preferred habitat is my neighbor's backyard where I can't get at them. But that notwithstanding, there are some environments where you're more likely to find a turkey. For years and years and years and years, it was believed that turkeys require lots of unbroken timber to really thrive and reproduce and, and breed and and be a, a successful species in an area. We know that that's not the case anymore. There are lots of turkeys out there in the Great Plains, which is proof of, of this concept. Ideally, the habitat you're going to look for is going to contain the things that any other animal needs to live food water and shelter the rule of thumb that i try to use when i'm scouting turkeys or or a lot of folks try to use is if it's going to make a happy deer it's probably going to make a happy turkey they have really similar needs in terms of food but also the predators and the the steps they take to avoid predators are very similar so if it's deer friendly it's likely to be turkey friendly too you're looking for food water and shelter as i said So you're looking for places where turkeys can roost. They roost up in trees despite their size. They can actually fly. Not well, but they can fly. 
you're looking for food, so you're looking for the types of things they like to eat, which is pretty much anything. They'll eat eggs, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat seeds, they'll eat bugs, they'll, they'll eat a little bit of anything. And shelter, so we talked about trees. They they like to be able to see. They have really good eyesight. So they like to shelter somewhere, but they also like to be able to see. So open fields where they can strut and you know look all big and fancy for the ladies is you know a pretty good place to look for them if you're hunting turkeys in the timber you know the the same basic things are true but it's it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge that's why i think i've struck out a lot i hunt woods almost exclusively and and they're harder to find and it it's harder to see them so that's part of the, the thing i struggle with so scouting you can do a lot of what what you need to do in season but laying the groundwork in the early spring can really pay dividends you know as i just said turkeys do roost in trees so looking for trees with strong enough branches straight enough branches to hold a flock of turkeys or a bunch of turkeys or several turkeys or one turkey is a, a pretty good place if you're looking for somewhere where they roost turkeys can thrive in areas with sparse timber so long as there's enough food if you if you talk to a turkey biologist the ideal they'll tell you that what you're looking for is and this is a huge range and it makes me a little bit crazy for scientists you'd think that they'd be specific uh you're looking for ideal turkey habitat that's between 10 and 50 percent open non-forested lands and between and the balance being being forest the other thing to keep in mind when you're scouting turkeys is that they're messy little critters you can see turkey tracks in mud sand and snow you can find their feathers you can the scratching is is a pretty good indicator of, of where they are or how recently they've been there um this is what they do they they scratch at the ground when they're looking for food so if you're looking for hardwood ridges and you're you're walking along one if you if you see fresh scratches so they're going to turn over wet leaves you'll know that they've been there recently if it's dry um it's going to look dry it's going to be older um so you know keep that in mind while, while you're looking uh turkeys also poop like everything else the toms are going to have a almost like a j shaped poop and you just like dog poop you can tell if it's fresh or you can tell if it's you know a little bit older and you don't need to touch it you you can tell by looking if it's glistening it's pretty fresh the other thing to keep in mind is that turkeys are really noisy they once you found an area that that you think they're in if you slow down and we'll, we'll talk about it in, in a couple of minutes if you slow down and sit and listen you can hear them gobble or cut or pot or yelp they're going to make a lot of noise if you're if you're in an area where you think there's turkeys and they're not making any noises and you want to try something that that does work really well for a lot of people you can try getting a shock gobble which is exactly what it it sounds like if you scare a turkey with a, a predator sound, an owl hoot, a crow halt call, a coyote whistle, something like that, they will, out of shock, like literal surprise, will actually gobble, and you can use that to locate them. Those are called locator calls. I've heard turkeys gobble when somebody slams a car door in one of the, the houses near where I hunt. I've heard them respond to thunder. I've heard them respond to branches falling they respond to to these sounds so you can use that against them so in terms of scouting that's that's sort of the the big thing you, you know figure figure out where they are turkeys are creatures of habit so if you can figure out where they sleep where they're going to pitch down in the morning and where they're going to head after they pitch down you're you're well on your way to to actually shooting one in during the season in terms of times of day to scout, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. If you can get them out of their tree and know where they go and see what they do, you're, 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 you're well on your way to success. So in, that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of scouting. A lot of it is, is trial and error and, and getting to know your woods. In terms of actual hunting tactics this is what i i will normally try i'm going to start in the location where i found turkey sign that's a pretty much that's an obvious thing but before you sit down you want to make look around to make sure that you have shooting lanes for when your your turkeys come in and you want to 
use the terrain to find a place where as soon as the turkey is, is viewable, he's also in range. So that's going to be a ridge. That's going to be a small cut in the forest. I hunt a lot of logging roads. You want to you wanna really plan that out because you don't want him to have a lot of opportunity to look around and figure out that something's not right or the decoy doesn't look right or, hey, there's this gray blob over there that just moved. You, you don't want to give him that opportunity. So you want to get be able to get your shot on him, ideally, as soon as possible. You also want to want to have a place to lean, um, ideally, against a big tree. And we'll, we'll talk about this more in a little bit. But that big tree is, is, is both comfort, right? You, you have something to lean against. Uh, but it's also safety. When you're turkey hunting, you're wearing camouflage. You're wearing head-to-toe camouflage. And let's be honest, there's a lot of idiots out there who are going to shoot at sounds. They're not going to positively identify their targets. So if you're sitting there calling a turkey and somebody comes up behind you and shoots at your decoy, you want to have a big tree behind you to absorb as much of that shot as possible if there is an errant round. So in a perfect world, you're going to have your tree. They're going to pitch down. They're going to come into range. You're going to shoot them. Your, your hunt's going to be over first thing at first light. But what if they, it, that doesn't happen? What if they don't come into view? What if they pitch down and head off in another direction or you can't get close enough to see them fly down in the morning? This is one of the, the fun parts of turkey calling. You, you can call for them and they'll respond and, and come to you if you do it right, hopefully, most of the time. I'm a really not a great turkey caller, uh, but I can still get them to respond. Getting them to show up is an entirely different thing, but I can get them to, to cluck and cut and, and gobble back at me. Calling is effective with turkeys because when they're looking for love or they're looking for other hens or you know, friends to hang out with, for lack of a better term, turkeys make noises. You know, as I said before, they're, they're noisy buggers the the calling that they do is really an effort to get another bird to call back and head towards them or give them a, a place to be it's basically turkeys going hey where are you and responding and saying i'm over here come and find me if you imitate those song sounds relatively well you can get them to come straight to you there's a couple of different sounds that people talk about when when they're discussing turkey hunting a cluck, for example, is a single note. It's made frequently throughout the day. Gobblers make it, hens make it. They're often spaced out. It's just a noise that they make when they're happy and content and, and nothing's really going on. Hens have some vocalizations that are pretty typical of them. This is what you're, you're going to use to call in a turkey most often. Um, the yelp is like three notes in a row to eight notes in a row. It's the calling option, like I said, that, that you're most often going to be using in the spring to lure gobblers in. It's higher pitched than the yelping of gobblers. It's 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 the sound, to me at least, that, that's most associated with turkey hunting. It's kind of a yop, yop, yop sound. One of the interesting things is jake turkeys, young yearling turkeys, the equivalent of a yearling deer, don't, jakes don't gobble, they or don't gobble well. They will instead yelp. So it's it's a and it's a different kind of yelp. It it almost sounds like somebody's somebody's yelping or trying to gobble, and their voice is breaking. I mean, it, it really does sound like a teenager trying to to vocalize, and their and their voice breaks. It's pretty cool to hear. So, with calling, you obviously need some way of of replicating the sounds that turkeys make, and and there are a few different ways to do this. I'm going to talk about the ones that I find the most user friendly, and I'm not going to dive into the ones that I don't either have experience with, like push calls, um, or I'm just not as good with uh, diaphragm calls. But I, I will discuss diaphragms a little bit because they are an important part of turkey hunting. In my opinion, and I think in a lot of people's opinions, the easiest call to use is a box call. They're exactly what they sound like. They're boxes made out of wood or some other natural material or not unnatural material. They, they make them out of plastic, and it has a lid. When you, when you scrape the bottom of the call, the box part of the call against the lid, there's a little lip that vibrates and resonates. Some box calls have two lips, some only have one. The, the motion and vibration of the scraping 
resonates inside the box and makes the sound. It's it's in a perfect world going to be what a turkey sounds like, and they're they're they are pretty foolproof. I got one from Huntfault a number of years ago that I still use. It's by Adventure Game Calls, and I love it. It's two sided. It has two different tones, and it sounds like a turkey day in day out. It sounds like a turkey. I make my wife a little crazy playing with it sometimes in the basement. She yells at me, tells me to stop. I put it away and, and, and take it out when I'm, I'm going turkey hunting. It's a lot of fun. I torture the cats with it. What can you say? With a box call, you can do a little bit of everything. You can make yelps. You can cut. You can putt, which is that putting is the sound that they'll make when they're startled or, or aren't sure what's going on. Uh, some people, not me, but some peop- people can even gobble with a box call. It's a really good all-around tool and a great place to start. They range from the super cheap where they're going to cost 10 bucks. People pay hundreds of dollars for them. I'd say, you know, you, you can get a pretty decent box call for about 50 bucks, and it, it'll last you forever. Beaver Creek Game Calls makes a lot of great product. I have their a bunch of their mouth calls that I, I like a lot. I have one of their, we'll talk about it in a second, but a pot call. Uh, they actually just got filter, featured in Field and Stream for one of their box calls, which is really cool and, and you know a great achievement for them. So you know those are those are some places to look. If you go to Cabela's, they'll have a ton of them. Uh, you you will not be spoiled for choice. The next thing I'm going to talk about are, are slate calls that I, I just referenced. They vary by style, but they have the same overall design. They're going to have some sort of surface that you're going to drag a stick across or a, a, a rod across. So the one I have is glass, and it's attached to the, kind of a hollow bottom that has holes drilled underneath to create a place for sounds to resonate within kind of that, that hollowed out space. The striker is the other half of this. It's it's the handheld part, or they're both handheld parts, but it's the part that you're going to actuate as as you're you're trying to call. You drag, or you before you can drag anything, you have to dress the the top of the the pot call. By and large, you're going to use fine grit sandpaper on something that's aluminum or glass, and you want to rough it up so something it you you have something to to rub against and you have somewhere to. Ha- trigger some vibrations to use the call and you can use it for everything from really loud cuts and and putts and and kind of tradition clucks traditional turkey sounds to really quiet versions of the same thing they're they're a really versatile tool and what you do is you just drag your your striker across the top and it makes turkey sounds ideally it takes substantially more practice than using a box call even to to use one at a basic level but once you do it it's it's a really flexible dynamic strong tool for a, a turkey hunter if you're serious about them. The next one I'm going to talk about is is the diaphragm call or the mouth call. Um, these are the, the little bat wing shaped or horseshoe shaped probably more accurately calls that people put in their mouths and you see kind of hardcore turkey hunters rotating three or four through their mouth to, to get different resonances and different tones. At its most basic level it's a piece of aluminum with some latex sandwiched between it with some tape over it and uh, either a cut or a couple of cuts or no cuts made in it. The cuts will will affect the sound and ha- the tonality and the raspiness of it. In the old days, uh, when people were making their own mouth calls, they would go and they'd use condoms. Uh, they'd buy as many condoms as they could get. Ray I tell, tells about just buying out grocery stores of all the condoms they had to make mouth calls You know, in his early days of, of selling and making them. The, the latex part is called the reed. It's stretched across the frame inside a skirt or, or uh, the skirt's made out of, as I said, tape or latex or, or something else. By blowing, by putting the reed, the, the call on the top of your mouth and blowing air across it, you can make turkey sounds if you're good or not so good, but if you practice enough. Those are the three basic calls that you're most frequently going to see. They make push calls that are going to make turkey sounds. I, I just don't have any experience with them. Some folks were going to use are going to use shaker calls that are going to replicate a gobble. It's not something that I like to do. If you're out in the woods hunting, your 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 ears are peeled for the sound of gobbling. So you're going to, as a hunter, you're going to hone in on that. So if somebody else is out there using a, a gobbler, a shake call, chances are you're going to pull in. 
you might pull in a, a, a territorial Tom, but you might also pull in a hunter who's who's going to pull a trigger on you. So it's not really something I recommend. One of my first seasons hunting, I was creeping through the woods, moving from one spot to another, and I was hearing very, very quiet gobbles. I was like, oh, there's a turkey. So I started moving towards it and moving towards it and moving towards it. And I'd move and I'd stop and I'd sit down and I'd use my box call to make a couple of calls. And then... I'd hear the gobble back very quietly. So I, I'd move in the next direction. And, and after about 10 minutes of this, moving through the woods really quietly, stopping, calling, stopping, calling, I see the shape rise out of the 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 brush ahead of me. And it's, it's a guy who was using a shaker call. He said, you're the biggest hen I've ever seen. I said, you're the biggest time you've ever seen, I've ever seen. Kind of laughed about it and moved on. So, you know, fortunately, both neither of us had our fingers on the trigger. Nobody, neither of us were, were jumped up. And it was kind of a, a thing to laugh about, talk about, and move on. But it could have ended poorly if, you know, we weren't paying attention. So I don't like using, you know, shaker calls or gobblers. But some people do. You know, it's, it's a good way to get territorial response out of, out of a, a tom. So that's kind of the basics of it. Calling, scouting the like i think one of the things i like talking about it at, on on this podcast is the gear it's the f- fun part i mean all of turkey hunting is fun but it's it's one of the parts that a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about and and trying to perfect their setup they agonize it over it just as much as they do tactics or strategy or calling before we dive in there the, the, i want to talk about you know we're going to talk about clothing but i'm going to talk about one of the things that you should not under any circumstances where it's actually three things you don't want to wear red white or blue no american flag buff no american flag patch on your hat nothing no red white and blue the reason for this is pretty obvious um turkeys tom turkeys heads are red white and blue depending on on how they are how what mood they're in or or what's really going on so you don't want to wear anything that's going to attract the attention of a hunter um most People shoot at sounds, unfortunately, and they're really going to shoot at red, white, and blue colors. So if, if you're making turkey sounds and you're wearing red, white, and blue, and they only get a little bit of a, a, a look at it, you do run the risk of getting shot at, and that's really not something you want. In terms of gear, I I can't say I'm a minimalist. I am a geardo. I, I do carry probably a little bit more than I really need to. A, a typical clothing setup for me is going to be head to toe camo. I tend to wear a, a technical weight base layer with my shirt tucked into my base layer pants and my base layer pants tucked into my socks. That's for a couple of reasons. One, it's it's just how I get dressed when I'm going out hunting, keeping everything tucked in. Keeps me from getting rocks or leaves or anything into my, my socks, which can be a distraction. Uh, but also, you know, this is spring, so it's tick season. I don't, I don't want to catch Lyme disease. By taking those steps, I feel like I'm going to limit my exposure of ticks getting in up into my underwear or down into my, my boots and, and latching on. Up here in New England, Lyme disease is a huge problem, so I, I take a lot of precautions there. Over my base layers, I'm going to wear a long sleeve uh, camo t-shirt in case I want to strip off a layer and still want to be camouflaged. Over that, uh, over you know, on my legs, I'm going to wear either a pair of camo pants uh, or a pair of dark green tactical pants, if you will. I use 511 Tac Light Pros in, in dark green if it's too hot for my, my hunting pants, which are fleece lined. If it's cooler or I'm just going to be out for a little while, I'll, I'll wear the full camo pants. Over that, I'm almost always going to wear a camo sweatshirt for a bunch of reasons. One, the one I, I have that I wear turkey hunting is waterproof. So if you do get a pop-up shower, at least your torso is going to stay dry. Also, you know, when turkey season in Massachusetts starts the end of April, it's still pretty cool here in the mornings. It's not uncommon for it to be down in the 30s when I when you get out there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then warm up a little bit during the day. So I, I like to, to be able to layer. If it's really cold, if you're down in the 30s, I'm going to wear a jacket camouflage one of the also things i like to wear is a, a face buff at a head net the buff for a couple of reasons one you know it, it helps break up my silhouette a little bit it also keeps flying insects away from my face and the head net does kind of does the same thing it, it breaks up your silhouette i wear mine tucked up under a ball cap i know some people wear boonie caps i just like ball caps it helps keep the sun out of my eyes helps break up my silhouette i look really cool with one on as well so you know i do that too the other thing to keep in mind is there are some chemical additives that you can wear to help uh, 
with the, the tick problem, I treat my whole outfit from socks on up to per, with permethrin. Uh, or sometimes I'll use tea tree oil if I can't treat ahead of time. Remember, t- permethrin is poison. It's it's a neurotoxin. It will it will definitely kill small animals. It can make you really sick as well. Uh, so if you can't treat your clothes in a well ventilated area, uh, tea tree oil is a really good option uh, to treat your clothes with. You can mix it up with some water and spray it on your clothes. It also smells good. So you know if if, if that's something important to you when you're out turkey hunting, you know you can you can definitely keep that in mind. The other thing, you know, I, a lot of people overlook are boots and uh, and socks. For me, uh, if my feet get uncomfortable or get cold, I'm going to have a really miserable day. So I, I spend probably more money I, than I should on both boots and and hunting socks. Uh, Darn Tough makes really good socks. I have a, a or I'm going to pick up a pair on, on the recommendation of, of a, a friend of mine who I'm actually going to end up hunting with, Larry, um, out in Western Massachusetts this year. Uh, Darn Tough makes good ones. Believe it or not, Cabela's, their boot cut merino wool socks are great. I just wear them hanging out or, or walking around. I'm, I'm a fan of merino wool. In terms of boots, uh, depending on what I'm doing or how much walking I'm going to do, I'm going to wear one of three pairs. I have a pair of Merrill just hiking boots that are really comfortable, really rugged, really warm. Um, that's what I'm going to wear if I'm going to do the most walking. If it's cold and I'm going to do a decent amount of walking, I have a pair of, I talked about these in a, another episode, a pair of Cabela's Iron Ridge boots. They're leather. Uh, the ones I have are about 800 grams of thin slate. Awesome, really durable, really tough, really comfortable. If I'm not going to do much walking, if I'm hunting my little pocket woods in in the town a couple overs over from me, um, I'll just wear a pair of muck boots, the same ones that I'll wear early deer season or upland hunting. They're comfortable. They go up. So if I you know I do end up crossing some water or having to wade through some some deeper puddles or a stream, I don't have to worry about my feet getting too wet. So those are, are three good options. In terms of the firearms you use, most people are going to hunt with some form of shotgun. Something in the 12 gauge range is more than enough gun for turkey hunting. I know a lot of people who harvest a lot of turkeys with a 16 or a 20 gauge. Maybe 30 years ago, that wasn't going to do it for you. The cartridges, the shotgun shells weren't developed enough and weren't specialized enough to really make that a great option. These days, however, ammunition being as advanced and and as good as it is you can slay turkeys all day long with the 20 gauge it's patterning is is going to be a little bit more important than if you're shooting a big 12 gauge but you know it'll it'll definitely get it done i hunt with the same shotgun that i i take deer hunting or upland hunting it's a remington 870 made in the 70s it's a wingmaster i love it choke is pretty important you want a nice tight pattern gives you a little bit more range and gives you a lot of of i hate the term but stopping power an extra full choke will will do the job they make turkey chokes that cost 120 bucks i'm sure they're terrific they're ported they're they're really fancy they're slick looking Uh, i i i'm sure they're great i just don't see the need to to spend 120 dollars on a shotgun choke in terms of shells Anything's going to work. I shoot two and three quarter inch shells because it's it's what my shotgun's chambered in. Again, modern shotgun shells being as good as they are, I don't have any qualms about just wounding a turkey. There are folks who do swear by three or three and a half inch shells. I'm sure that's a, a great solution. Uh, it seems like it's a lot of bullet for a, to, to pull, pull a turkey's head. And it's gonna hurt a lot. Shotgun turkey loads are are pretty heavy on the on the powder, so there's definitely a lot of kick there. So, you know, if you're a big tough guy or tougher than I am, go for it. I I personally just don't think it's necessary. Some folks shoot a ten gauge turkey hunting, which just seems like madness to me. But you know, if it makes you happy, go for it. All of that said, patterning your gun is vital. If you've got a three inch hole in the middle of your pattern. I bet you dollars to donuts that that's exactly where the turkey's head is going to be when you shoot. When I practice, when I aim at turkeys, when I'm visualizing, I'm going to drop the bead or the red dot or whatever I'm using as, as a sighting device. I'm going to put it right on the turkey's waddle, right under their chin, so that most of the pattern is going to go there based on how my shotgun is patterned. 
if you do have a hole in the pattern and you can't can't figure out if it's because of the way you're shooting or it's just your gun try a different load of of turkey shells they cost about 20 bucks for a box you'll go through a couple and figure out what works for you i use remingtons they're they're great they're inexpensive i've had the same box for years well, largely because i haven't shot any turkeys but also i mean you're it's it's a one-shot game you know you shoot your turkey and you're done it's not like you're going to need a couple of follow-ups if, if you do it right one of the just for for note one of the quote-unquote in things right now is is reaping turkeys this is when you use a, a fan and a a smaller size shotgun 410 shotgun or, or pistols that can fire a 410 round are very popular right now basically you 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 creep into strutting grounds you know used by turkeys with a fan up in front of you and kind of creep in on the turkey using that fan as as a shield almost and once you get close to the turkey arms range reach or, or a couple arms reach you you shoot the bird to me this is this is just crazy it's insane i see it as just dangerous borderline reckless i think it it if you hunt public land it opens you up to being shot by a reckless inexperienced or unsafe hunter who shoots at the f bigger fan he sees rather than taking the ethical shot on the bird that he knows is a bird or he doesn't see you sneaking up behind the turkey and shoots the bird that he thinks he's all alone on and ends up shooting you in the face with really hot loaded seven or eight size shot i think it's just a, a bad idea but to each his own the the final topic i want to touch on here in this really quick overview of, of basic turkey hunting are decoys people spend a lot of money on decoys people spend a little bit of money on decoys and and there's a wide variety of options out there I don't bring them when I hunt in timber because the sight lines are just too short in most New England farm forests for them really to be helpful. It's it's overgrown. There's a lot of low-level cover. So I, I feel like a turkey decoy is just going to end up surprising them when they, they come up to me versus seeing the, seeing the decoy from across the field and coming up to it looking for a fight, being really able to, in as much as a turkey can, think about the whole process, say, oh, yeah, this makes sense go up to them, pick a fight, win, mate with the hen. If I do use a decoy, it's probably because I'm hunting along a logging trail or a larger clearing in the woods. And they are useful tools. They're, they, they are not just there to look cool. Gobblers really do look for fights. They want to prove that they're the biggest and baddest guy out there and they're territorial. So they don't really want another gobbler or God forbid a Jake coming in and muscling in on their women. So when you when you're trying to to bring them into a, to a spread, you do want to have a, a Jake decoy in there to kind of make it seem like a, a inferior turkey is coming in to to skeeve on their women, if you will. By and large, what I'm going to use and what a lot of folks use successfully is a hen and a Jake or a he, two hens and a Jake. This is going to challenge most gobblers. It's enough attraction with the women and enough threat from the guy that it's going to bring them in. What's great is that young turkeys, young, you know, from Jake's or a little bit older, the two-year, you know, more mature turkeys are, are, are going to make up the most of the harvest this every spring, and they are the most aggressive birds out there. Jake's because they're just plain stupid and they don't really know what's going on, and two-year-old birds who are, re are really feeling their oats, so they're going to aggressively come in and, and prove that they're the biggest and bag baddest out there. I'm trying a new type of, of decoy this year. It's, it's made by Sentinel Decoys. They make flat pack decoys that you fold out, and they kind of look 3D. It's pretty neat. They, they really do look good, so... I'm looking forward to giving them a shot. Hopefully, they're a good slump buster for me. And I you know, I, I would strongly recommend giving them a, a, a look-see as you are shopping for decoys, if, if that's a route you want to go. Actually, I, th I thought of another piece of gear that I, I in my opinion, is, is absolutely vital. You know, as I said before, I carry a lot of gear with me when I go out hunting, probably more than I should. So I need a place to put that. My first year out, I just took a backpack with me and it was fine. It gave me a convenient place to sit. It was a little bit bulky for what I was trying to do. So I, I invested in a turkey vest, actually. Now I have two. It's a pretty convenient place, a turkey vest, to, to stash your snacks, shells, water, calls, kind of the, the stuff you're going to need with you. I, I have 
the first one I bought is a Tactical Tater 2 by Cabela's. It's set up more like a load-bearing vest like you'd see in the military. It had, So it's side entry, you put it on over your head, not like a, a traditional vest. It has call pockets in the front. It has a, a convenient water bottle pouch right below my, my right arm so I can get there. It straps in really tight, so if you're moving through a lot of brush, you're not going to have very much travel maneuvering. It carries a lot of stuff. It has a nice big game pouch in the back. What I particularly like about it is that it has, and and the better, in my opinion, Turkey Vest will have this too, uh, it has a built-in seat for you. It, it's a cushion that, that you can tuck up into your game pouch or you can, as you're walking around, or you can kind of leave it hanging. It gives you a nice, comfortable place to sit if you're out in the woods. You know, you, you can plan the best, look around, make sure you pick a good spot, but chances are there's going to be a rock or a root or something like that that you're going to end up sitting in. That, that seat keeps you up off the ground, gives you some padding, keeps you warm, and keeps you comfortable. Because I guarantee if you're wiggling around because you're uncomfortable, Turkey's going to see the movement and it's going gonna, it's gonna to skedaddle. And that's going to end your hunt pretty good. Because once they're gone, they, they tend to stay gone for, for the rest of the day. Or the rest of the season, depending on, on what happens. So, uh, you know, something with a pad that's going to be able to keep you comfortable is, is a great choice. The the tactical tater, tatter, whatever you want to call it, also came with a, a kickstand, if you will. It's it's a little iron uh, tubed kickstand, like you would see on a bike or a motorcycle, that you can actually pop out and lean up against if you can't set up at a tree up against a tree. Uh, fortunately, where I hunt, it's almost all trees, so I don't really have to worry about that. But you know, it, it is a kind of a cool addition if you if you want to go that direction. And in a nutshell, that's turkey hunting. Uh, My plans for the year are, as I said before, I'm going to head out to Western Mass and hunt with my buddy Larry. Uh, He's picked out a couple of spots for us, assuming the snow melts and, you know, the ground dries out and we don't have torrential flooding or anything like that. I'm also planning a couple of hunts in my pocket woods, uh, including one with my buddy Adam, who's down in Rhode Island. If everything goes according to plan, we'll get him his first turkey uh, in those woods too. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, last year, I only got out one day with the baby coming and, and moving. But this year, I, I have a few more days blocked out on the calendar. I'm going out for the opener and a couple of Saturdays after that. Uh, if I'm really, really lucky, I'll have a, a couple of work site visits in the afternoon. And I can I can get out in the morning before I go out and, and try to get a, a couple of midweek hunts in. Looking forward to it. I'm excited for it. I hope you guys are excited for it. Hopefully, this was a useful podcast for for those of you who are getting into it i know it covered a lot really quickly but it's it's a good place to start and, and at least get you thinking about it hunting fishing shooting related I'm, I'm delighted to have you on so thanks for listening uh if you're going out turkey hunting shoot straight and have fun